So what do we know? We know that the integration process starts out, at least for us, with us being empty. Brand new soul imputed to a newly emergent body that creates a human being and God directly does that at each birth. When we say born dead, it means no soul was imputed to that fetus. Because we start out empty, we're little sponges. The soul that God gives you is equipped with yes, no, believe, not believe, want, not want, and a facility for imitating and a facility for storing information. Now because of the yes, no, and the want, not want, because those are his characteristics, you get to pass judgment on everything that comes into your soul. And because your body is kitted out with absorb as a sponge and imitate, and that's connected to your soul, that will be what you want to do. Because you don't yet know that you choose and can choose against. It's real important to understand this. It's called the law of accountability in the Bible. But I'm going to, I, I want to show its role in integration. You are constantly choosing. And in the beginning, a combination of your body's innate structure and your soul's innate structure plus its emptiness means that you're just going to say yes to everything. Now you're actually going to end up saying no to stuff you don't like. But your like and dislike is going to be governed by whether you deem a feeling or an impulse or an input to be nice or not nice. Whether you like it or not. One of the things we learn later on in life is that people have much varying degree of acceptance or rejection of circumstance, pain, suffering, all of that. One person's pain is another person's pleasure, even. And that a certain amount of pain will not be recognized or even regarded as pain until it reaches a certain threshold. It's all a matter of taste, which is a matter of will. Some people like lemon meringue pie, some people like peanut butter, the same thing is true for all pain, suffering, feeling. Okay? So you're the arbiter of your own life from the get-go, but you do not have the ability to detect what's good and bad for you, right and wrong, when you're born. You have to learn it. And you can't learn it if you don't want to learn it. And you won't want to learn it if it doesn't feel good to you. Kind of a catch-22. That much I've said many times before. Maturation is based on whether or not you choose to keep learning. Really. As a human being or as a spiritual being. Do you want to know? On the things where you say, I don't want to know. Then you won't. And to the extent you don't know, you remain childish on those subjects. Now, a whole lot of people, early on in life, early, 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 they like the way certain things feel, and they just keep on pressing the button, as it were, to get that feeling again. And that's all they want. So, they don't know beyond those things. So they end up being childish as humans. And the evidence of just how childish humanity is kind of sad. 
kind of makes you wonder why we allow the vote to be universal. Look at what movies are popular. Look at what TV programs are popular. Look at how people can't even bother to read directions. You had the mob in Rome. It was called the Anona. Give it bar the barley or wheat, mostly barley. Wheat was very expensive. They called it corn in translation, but it was frumentum in Latin. It just meant grain. You got a kilo a day. If you're a Roman citizen, you got a kilo, 2.2 pounds, of grain a day, usually barley, some cheaper version, okay? Spelt, depending on what it was. And half of the year, good six months out of the year, there was some kind of public entertainment And the idea was to keep you docile and pleased and feeling good enough so that you wouldn't rebel. That's what most people wanted, their version of tea and baguette. And as long as they had that, that was enough. And they were ignorant, although they could read. And some of the most cute graffiti that's ever been written was in Rome. And they were banal. They were prurient. They were basic. They were bestial. And therefore the entertainment that mattered to them was very body. I mean really, really explicitly sexually body. Just like today. And violent, just like today. They didn't have the technology of today. So whereas we get our violence on TV, they had to see it actually happen live. But the tastes were the same. So when growing up with the empty soul and the deciding what feels good a whole to a whole lot of people, all they want is the pump, 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 and the bang, 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 bam, bam, bam. That's enough. They might as well be beasts. They don't want more than that. That's how they use their humanity, to be beasts. That's how it stays. That's as much integration, even into humanity, that they want. So when trying to even consider the idea of God, it can't be done. Because they're not interested. They got what they want. They want God to be a beast like them. So they always cast him in bestial terms. Sugar daddy and petty judge. That's why religion is what it is. Religion is bestial by nature. It's always talking about the body, 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 body. There's nothing intellectual whatsoever about it. So too, all those who are anti-God are bestial. Body, 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 body. I don't care how intellectual they claim to be. If you're a true intellectual and you just start looking at math or the sky or biology, you can't remain an atheist. Can't. Not if you're honest and logical. It's not possible to look at math and not know there's a God. It's just not possible. If you want proof of God outside the Bible, math is it, baby because it drives the universe and yet has no mass and no energy. Principles drive the universe. Principles. Well, principles have to have a mind behind them. 
Principles can't just mindlessly exist. Just like your corpuscles can't do anything. They're mindless. There's no such thing as a superior race because all of the races are mindless biological corpuscles. Corpuscles don't create themselves. They're obeying something. That something is neither mass nor energy. So there's an entire invisible dimension that has nothing to do with the material. The immaterial has to be running the material. There has to be an immaterial running it. And if it's running it, then it has to be a mind. And you got a mind. And it doesn't have mass or energy either. There is an effect on mass and energy, like math has an effect on the universe. But it itself is neither mass nor energy. So if you're a mathematician, you cannot honestly be either an intellectual or an atheist. You're being dishonest somewhere. That's why I have absolutely no respect for any of them. I used to. When I didn't understand it myself, I used to. The proof is as patent as possible that a God of some definition exists. Which one and which definition, that's a little more difficult question. But to say that, oh, there can't be a God? You're a dishonest son of a bitch. Or too dumb to live, take your pick. Sorry. Okay. Those are harsh words. But look at it. Math has no mass or energy. Math exists, everybody knows that. We use it every day. You can't live without math. Math makes the world go round. Math principles, physics, are just versions of math principles. How do math principles get here? And since they are neither mass nor energy, but mass and energy exist, how do mass and energy come to exist from non-mass and energy? How does the immaterial beget the material? If you're a real intellectual, you should be asking those questions. And all those who claim, oh, there can't be a God, there's proof, there's no God, because all there is is the material. Honey, you're too damn done to live. And nobody should even talk to you. Now, what does that actually mean, though? It means that childishly, somewhere when you were young, you didn't like the feeling of the idea, idea, ideas like math. It has no mass or energy, yet ideas run you. Ideas are not math, they're not energy, they're ideas. And somewhere along the line, the idea of God, you didn't like it. So now you're spending your life trying to deny that the idea of God has any validity whatsoever. And you would like it very much if everybody else agreed with you. Fine. Be your own Don Quixote if you want. I don't need you to agree with me about my idea of God. And you don't need me to agree with you about yours. Now where am I getting at here? The integration process goes from being filled up with all these ideas, feelings, inputs, and you're constantly choosing what you like and don't like. Whether you're right or wrong doesn't matter, you're choosing, and that makes it real to you. And then you imitate all those inputs. So stage one, from being a baby, to the start of the maturation integration process because maturation is a form of integration you start out being filled up filled up filled up filled up filled filled up and while it's the information is incoming you're choosing yes no yes no want like don't like you don't even have to have a reason and you don't usually have one you just like it or you don't and along the way, part of the ideas you get filled up with are ideas or concepts or posits about God. 
So by the time you're seven, you've done a lot of, you've gotten a lot of information filled in your head. Also, by the time you're seven, you have responded to all those inputs by trying to do what those inputs are. Mommy smiles at you, and you don't know what a smile is, and you don't know that's what it is, but you decide you like it, so you try to repeat it, and you try to do the same thing. And it's sort of innate to smile when you feel good. And something about mommy smiling and holding you makes you feel good, and so you try to repeat and you smile too. And you like how that feels, so you do it again. And again, and again, and again. So the second stage of maturation is imitation. First, you get filled up with information. It's information is first. Imitation is second. And then the third step is where you have to decide or rule on or re-examine what information and imitation has been. Sort of like revisit it. Analyze it. Once you get a lot of imitation and you get a lot of information, then there comes a point where you want to like take stock. Analyze. Think over. So for lack of a better word, we'll call that inspection or introspection. Introspection is a kind of inspection of what's inside you. But we'll call it inspection because that includes inspecting what's around you as well. So you've got information is stage one. Imitation is stage two. Inspection is stage three. You start at some point in your life, you start inspecting everything around you and yourself. And you start drawing conclusions. And you start wanting to ask more questions. And you start wanting to understand what you like and what you don't like. And what you like, you want to understand more. And what you don't like, you want to understand less. Or the thing you want to understand is how to stop what you don't like. And the other thing you want to understand is how to get more of what you do like. Now one of the things that during this time of information and imitation that ought to occur to you at some point is the idea of truth versus the idea of lies, the idea of good versus the idea of bad. Now good and bad we start equating real early. If I feel good then it is good, which is a lie, but hey, it's not always a lie. And if it feels bad it must be bad. Which also isn't always true. So then it becomes an inspection question. Well, if it feels good, is it is it good? If it feels bad, is it bad? And that's where your parents are supposed to teach you. Hi, a thing might feel bad but be good. And a thing might feel good but be bad. And that's a hard lesson for kids to want to learn. And then they give you all kinds of things to do so you can imitate the idea that they taught you and see it play out as being true or false. And during that process, you're supposed to want to integrate with what's true, whether it feels good or bad, because of what it means, because of the idea. So now you have to learn to want an idea even if it goes against what feels good. And you'll, you'll learn to do that because if you want to imitate mommy or daddy who wants that idea, then you want to imitate wanting the idea too. And as you get older and you imitate and you use the information and you get results, you start to inspect the results and then you start to choose it, and here's the fourth stage, independently. 
information, imitation, inspection, independence. And it's only as you grow in independence on each topic that you become mature. Most people don't. They don't want to be independent. They don't want to inspect. Most people never get beyond information and imitation on anything. So if the world at large says that it's good to wear underwear on your head in order to be holy, that's what they'll do. And honey, all religion is that silly. All the world's contentions about what reality is, those contentions are all that silly. Hi, if you gain political power, you're going to be a good person, important, and change the world. Do you know how many times that lie has been sold in history? And how many times in history has it actually worked? None. There are maybe five people in history you could say. They really had a big impact on the world. But they didn't change people. People go right on being the putzes that they are. And the people who had this huge impact on history, what they get for their pains? Absolutely nothing. Or, well, no, take it back. They got assassinated by the very people they helped. Go look at the people who really had a huge impact on history. And look what happened to them. Julius Caesar assassinated. Jesus Christ assassinated. Even if you don't believe in Christ, you have to admit that his life had a huge impact on history because everybody's constitution is based on the law he lived under. And pretty much the whole of the West was formed based on Christianity, for better and for worse. So whatever you think of him, everything got affected by him. Not correctly, not the way he really lived his life, not the way he really was, but the idea of him changed the world. The ideas promoted by Julius Caesar changed the world. We're all living those ideas out for both of those J's, Julius and Jesus. Both of those J's affected everybody in the world to this day. We're all living on ideas that were promulgated by both of those men. Rightly or wrongly, morphed or not, mutated or not, correctly or not from versus what they actually said. We're living on all those ideas. Julius Caesar got assassinated for his pains. So did Christ. Now there are other people you could name if you want. It's really important to history. Whether you want to do what the James Burke series as, you know, the day the universe changed. I wish I could find that series. It's a really good series. Maybe it's sold in PBS. A lot of inventions. It was about inventions that changed the way the world works. But guess what? Not even Jesus Christ himself changed human nature. So the world isn't a better place, not even because of him. And what does that tell you? That tells you that the integration process is its own sovereignty, by divine design really. And there has to be a divine design because if math exists, then there's a mind behind it. If anything immaterial runs the material, and hello everywhere you turn it does, then there has to be a mind running the immaterial. Because how does the immaterial derive its power? Has to be life. If it's immaterial, it has to be alive. And if it's alive, it has to have a mind. And why do we know? Because it's organized and predictable.
So somebody has to be ordaining it. Now what you call that person, well that's up to you. But to say there's no such person is to say there's no such thing as math. So then you're sovereign over your life to say there's no such thing as God, despite the fact that math exists. So reality to you is this contradiction that you refuse to recognize as a contradiction. Okay, fine, that's your free right, that's your free will, that's your sovereign right, that's your sovereign will, and it governs your life. So what does that mean you're doing? You're absorbing information. You're imitating the world's conclusion about it. And you're not independent. And yet you have the independence to rule that you not be independent. So now you're a beast going along with the herd. Because they don't like the idea of God either. Not even Christians and Jews like the idea of God because we're constantly trying to turn him into a beast. See, with beasts, you have to do... Beast 1 does for Beast 2 and they all travel in the herd together and it has to be for the benefit of the herd and it's only about the herd and the herd is God and really a dog doing pet tricks. And that's what we'll call God. Okay. There you go. Now you're integrated with the herd. The integration process is with the herd. You're herd bound and you call yourself intellectual because X number of other people are going to call you intellectual because they agree with you. Not because you're actually intellectual but because you're saying what they want to hear. You're imitating them. Not independent. Because the last thing the herd wants you to be is independent. Independent is bad. Independent means that you're free of the herd. Yeah. And God wants you to be free of the herd. God even wants you to be free of him. Because he's free. And he doesn't want you just believing because he says so. But when you're a baby, you need the information coming into you. And then you need to imitate it. And just like your parents teach you good from bad, he parents you. But at some point, you, he's, you gotta, he's going to kick you out of the nest. And that's like the Job story. And Job finally concludes, I know in my flesh I'll see God. Job doesn't even want to be human except to see God. That's an independent conclusion on Job's part. Because God's certainly not doing anything to make him want God. He's got boils. He lost his family. His wife, his, even his own wife said, just curse God and die. He says to her, Ah, oh, you're talking like a foolish woman. She was a foolish woman, but he couldn't even bring himself to say that. That was all independent conclusion of Job on Job's own part. God says to Abram, Hi, Genesis 15. You don't even have any kids yet. I promised you I'd give you like more kids than the stars in the sky. And you don't even have one kid yet. I will give you kids, but see, I'm going to send them into slavery for 400 years. And then I'm going to bring them out as a nation. And that point, when you'll long be dead, then they'll begin the process of having more kids than the stars of the sky. You'll never see it. That's an enticing promise, isn't it? Hi, I'm going to shit on your kids for 400 years. And you'll never even see the first one live, you know, up to adulthood. Now believe in me. Would you believe in a promise like that? Would you find that at all enticing? 
could you say that God bribed you? Didn't he just promise you a really horrible future? So why did Abraham believe? And Abraham finally has a son when he's a hundred years old. And that kid is like between 20 and 40 years old. The Hebrew word is not and It means somebody of marriageable age. And in that same passage, using that word, he takes him up to the mountain. The verse that has that word in it's, uh, in English is translated, I and the lad will return. The word lad is not R, and it isn't a lad in English. It's young man of marriageable age, between age 20 and age 40. So Moses was, I mean, Abraham was expecting to come back with a resurrected Isaac. We find that out in uh, Hebrews 11. But why would he want to take him up to the mountain? Why didn't, back in Genesis 15, why didn't he say, oh God, what kind of promise is that? Why should I want to believe in you? But independently... He said, yes, okay. And independently, he takes Isaac up the mountain, figuring that, yeah, okay, I got to show that I, I'm willing to give him up. And he really was. And Isaac was willing to be given up. You know, he's not a kid anymore. So give Isaac credit, too. And they go up the mountain, and Isaac's obviously expecting to be res resuscitated, and Abraham's expecting him to be resuscitated, so he's going to slay him. Okay, or maybe Isaac didn't know until he laid him down, because he said, Father, where's the ram for the sacrifice? So he didn't know until Abraham told him to lay down. And he's no longer 100 at that point. He's like 120. Yeah, about 120. Because 40 years later, Isaac is going to have a kid. Abraham dies at 175, so Jacob and Esau were each 15 years old when Abraham dies. But back then, about age 120, 120, 130, he gets ready to slay him and God says, stop. That was all independent action on Abram's part. So he went from information to imitation to independence so much so that God can tell him a stupid thing to do and he actually understands what's behind it. But he doesn't know how independent he is until he actually goes through those motions. Because that was the worst thing that God could have asked him to do. Now that's going against not only, you know, independent and away from the herd. That's going against your own humanity. That's going against everything you care about and love. That's also what happened to Job. And it's supposed to happen to us. And it happened to Jesus Christ, who totally went against the herd and himself as God man so now you know that he totally integrated with God and so now you know when you go through the same process how integrated with God you are and then you turn on your TV and you see how the world is integrated with beasts Not at all intellectual. Totally, utterly incompetent in all their arguments. So incompetent that they don't even know they're incompetent. The so-called intellectuals? I could out-argue them in five minutes. And I'm a nobody. Except I understand Bible. And why do I understand Bible? Because God give it to anybody who wants to understand it. So that same thing, if it hasn't happened to you already, will be. Am I competent at carrying out the Bible I know? Not at all. That's the second type of integration. 
There's a maturation integration that occurs in your head, and then it has to occur in your body. Abraham depicts the integration of both. His hand was really going to slit the throat of his son, and his son was really going to let his dad do it. I'm not mature like that at all. I just know the story. I know what I'm supposed to do. And like Paul says in Romans 7, does it mean that I carry it out? No. Okay, well, that's the second stage of maturation. Second stage of integration. But honey, if you got the motions without the meaning, you're not integrated. And the world, especially Christians and Jews, are busy telling themselves how much, you know, how much they love God, bobbing in front of the wailing wall, or doing their little pet tricks for each other, and calling that spiritual. They're not integrated in their knowledge. So their action is not integrated with God. Very much integrated with the world, though. Slapping God's name on it. So what are they doing? They're not independent. They're imitating the world. And that's why the world says, Why should I want to be a Christian? Why should I want to be a Jew? Just be a moral person. Yeah, why not? Because that's how God of the Bible is sold. It's not what he is, and that's not what the Bible says, but that is how he's sold. And any given Sunday, on any given Saturday, you walk into a church or you walk into a synagogue, they're always selling morality. Imitating the human. Human imitation. And that's supposed to be godly and spiritual. No. It certainly isn't independent. It's as herd bound as it gets. God forbid that you should ever decide you want to believe in Messiah if you're Jew. They hold a get, which is a divorce ceremony, meaning that you're dead to them. I don't know who's more prejudiced. The Christians against the Jews or the Jews against the Christians? Hatfields and McCoys. It's really pathetic. We should be talking to each other and, re you know, helping each other learn. But we never have been. Pot kettle black. And we're all selling God as sugar daddy and petty judge. It's pathetic. So we're integrated with the world. We're not integrated with God. And so the world looks at us and says, Well, why should I want to be a Jew or a Christian? Why should I believe in your God? All I have to do is be a good person, then I go to heaven. That's what you're saying. And it is what they're saying. Well, then where is Christ in all that? Why do you go to a cross? What does a cross mean? Oh, he paid for your sins. So what? If I go to heaven because I'm a good person... I have to do good deeds to get into heaven. So what, what was the cross? See? The two J's that I began this audio with? The who most changed history? Their work is worthless. They get assassinated every single day. So, where do you want to be in all that? I don't know about you, but the stages are... After inspection, independence. And before inspection, imitation, which is where Christianity is. Imitating humanity. They haven't gotten to inspection. There's no introspection or any kind of inspection going on. And certainly there's none in Judaism either. Or they throw out the Midrash and the Talmud tomorrow. And we'd be throwing out the church fathers. Those are some of the stupidest books ever written. Which betray the fact that all we've ever done is imitate. We aren't inspecting. And then we just absorb information, absorb information, absorb information, and we never learn the information we absorb. But we spout it off and parrot it like parrots. You can teach a parrot to say anything. A parrot will never understand what he says. 
So we're good. We're good at absorbing information and then we imitate it and we repeat the sounds and then call ourselves spiritual. And we remain retarded five-year-olds in our theology and everything else, which is why we're so incompetent in everything and we can't even tell the difference between, between left behind, which should be left behind in the trash, and an actual biblical doctrine about the rapture. Which, yes, is pre trib but it's nothing secret about it. How can it be secret if it's been disclosed in the Bible all this time? And according to Paul, there might only be two Christians left on the earth when it happens. Because he says that nobody's going to really pretty much grow after Constantine. Well, we're about 2,000 years after Constantine. Well, not quite. 1,700 years after Constantine now. How many Christians actually know how to be saved? So are they. See, it's pretty bad. We're really childish. We're all imitating and repeating words and absorbing information like the Vlad of a stock telephone directory. Not able to tell the difference between any relevance there and relevance in scripture. Might as well be the Vlad of a stock telephone directory for all of our lack of understanding. We can't even translate the Bible rightly. And I'm sorry, but the vocabulary of the Bible is not that sophisticated. The meaning is sophisticated, but the words aren't. If you were a five-year-old Hebrew kid, by the time you were seven or eight or ten years old, pretty much all the words in the Bible you would already understand. It's like an eight-year-old vocabulary. Some of the, the way the words are used is sophisticated, but the words themselves are not at all hard to learn. Same thing for the Greek. Yeah, but no Greek person understands it, and no Hebrew person understands it. Because to understand it requires God's power. And to get God's power, you have to go past information. You have to go past imitation. You have to go past inspection and conclude independently that you want to know God. And then you have to keep on making that decision independently of the herd, independently of what people are saying about him. You have to just want God because you want God, irrespective of all other things. And then it gets harder and harder and harder to make that decision on a daily basis. The more you grow, the harder it gets. The, per, the hardest spiritual life of all was Christ, and he's God and man. And people think, oh, that made it easy. No, that made it harder. Because look at what being human is. It's disgusting. From the angelic perspective, they're amazed any of us believe in him at all. Because we're beasts. Hmm? Yeah, we are. Beasts with souls. So it's a miracle if you believe in him and it's a bigger miracle if you grow up in him. Because you have to go from information to imitation. Those are bestial. Information, imitation. Then you have to go to introspection or inspection. Now that's a human thing. And then from inspection to independence. And people don't want to go there. So they'll say whatever they need to fit in and imitate the world. And they'll sacrifice their independence for that sake. Now, that's integration. That's the integration process. You're integrating away from being an imitative, bestial being. And therefore, becoming more and more independent every day. Or you're integrating into a descent, a devolution, so to speak, of being human but living like an animal. Take your pick.